We're going to be doing a walk around the what we now call um, the Radcliffe Observatory Quarter, um, which is an area which belongs to Oxford University and is being redeveloped and has been already to a large extent um, for university buildings. Um, and the core of this um, is the Radcliffe Infirmary, which was Oxford's first hospital, um, begun in 1759, um, to the designs of um, a, basically a carpenter architect and surveyor from Eton um, called Stiff Leadbetter. Um, he was quite an active local builder um, and he was employed to design this building as a hospital for the surrounding area, for Oxford. Um, it's one of a number of provincial hospitals that went up around the middle of the 18th century. Um, there's one in Shrewsbury, there's one in Gloucester, um, there's one in Exeter. Most um, county towns had them and it's part of the big um, re reform um, in medicine um, for the um, for, for, for ordinary people in fact um, in the, in, in, at that time in the 18th century. The layout of the building um, is quite interesting. Um, the war, the administration was in the middle of the building um, and you actually went into it at what's now first floor level um, up two flights, up a flight of stairs, double flight of stairs um, and you can see that in old photographs. That was all changed um, in the 20th century and you now go in at ground level. So originally you'd have gone in upstairs to the first floor in the centre. Um, the wards were in the two wings um, and the operating theatres were upstairs in the attic. Very plain classical building. Um, a provincial um, surveyor would be perfectly capable of designing an elevation like that. It's not fancy at all, um, it's utilitarian and it was used um, as a hospital until quite recently. I remember when I was a student in Oxford, if you needed to um, see a consultant, this is where you came. I think it's excellent to remind people um, that, um, that what this building was built for and how many people um, uh, in Oxford, and you know, most people in Oxford are not members of the university, um, have used this building and been cared for in this building. And I think it's um, well worth remembering them. And the um, funding came from the will of Dr John Radcliffe, who was an extremely wealthy um, physician, made an enormous fortune, really large, um, which he left entirely to Oxford University. And the first building that was built out of that um, large sum of money um, was the building we now call the Radcliffe Camera, um, Radcliffe Library. Now, um, you will see um, one of the hospital um, additional buildings that was built in the um, 20th, 20th century. Um, this was the outpatients department um, and that's 1910 um, designed by an architect um, called E.P. Warren who did quite a lot of work in Oxford. He was actually the brother of the president of Magdalen College which must partly explain how he got the commission. It's quite an ingenious building. Um, the recessed centre um, was filled in recently, um, uh, in fact by Neil McLaughlin. And the interesting thing here, of course, are the two pedimented wings um, and the recessed centre. You, in fact, originally went into building from the, um, from the main road. Um, over to the chapel, um, and that's um, a fairly plain, um, relatively unremarkable building, 1864, um, by Arthur Blomfield, um, who, of course, designed 
and many, many, many churches throughout the country. Um, his most interesting building in Oxford is not this. Um, it's the um, Italian Romanesque style St Barnabas Church, um, 10 minutes to walk away um, by the canal. You'll recognise in front um, of the whole thing um, a copy of Bernini's Triton Fountain um, from Rome. Um, um, it provides quite a nice um, centrepiece to this courtyard. Um, we're looking through Raphael Vignoli's Mathematical Institute, um, which was the first of the new buildings to go up on the site. It's a very uh, masterly building, actually. You've got um, two big blocks. Um, one is facing me in front, and the other is to my left. Um, and between them, you've got this kind of atrium, um, which provides a route through to the um, old Radcliffe Observatory, which you can see here. So it's enticingly um, coming above the roof there. And in fact, from here, you get the best view of the top of the Radcliffe Observatory, um, which in which you can see um, the two figures um, um, support, uh, supporting the globe at the top. And underneath that, carvings um, of the winds um, from the Tower of the Winds in Athens. It gives us um, a very good idea of how the observatory fits in to the whole of this site. Um, I wouldn't say a great deal about um, the, the Vignoli buildings. I think they're um, very well massed. Um, I, I think they um, give a good sense of detail with the recess of the windows um, between the um, concrete frame. And I think the contrast um, between that and the glass atrium um, is very successfully done. It's worth just looking at the paving. Um, um, these arcs represent um, a non-repeating pattern discovered by Roger Penrose in 1974 um, and um, designed by him in 2012. Um, so in other words, what it's doing um, is representing mathematical thought. Um, and so it's a rather interesting building of what you might call architecture parlante in a way. Um, the, the building, um, the, the, the design of the building says something about its purpose. Well, what I like about the interior um, of this building um, is that it's light. You know, you just have to think about a lot of university buildings um, of the, especially of the um, 70s and so on. Um, and the way that um, the, the, everything, all the light is artificial. And this is making good use of natural light. And it's also giving you a sense of direction where you're going to. Um, you, you go through and you can see the observatory all the way. Um, the, most of the lecture rooms are actually downstairs. You go down um, those stairs there. And the offices um, the, for, for the mathematicians are in the buildings that you saw on either side before we walked in. So it's a cleverly designed building, um, which I think has, will, will um, well, it already is proving to be very successful. I think the most distinguished building on this site um, is the one we're looking at now, um, which is the Radcliffe Observatory, um, which to my mind is not only one of the best Oxford buildings of the late 18th century, but one of the best um, British or even European buildings. Um, it's an extremely interesting um, structure and again built out of money from um, John Radcliffe's bequest. There was still some money left over and the trustees of his will um, decided to put an observatory here um, which consisted basically of two single-story wings which contains um, fixed instruments. In other words, the big um, uh, uh, telescopes. Observatories have a fascinating history. Um, they, um, I mean, we know that the um, ancients observed the stars. In fact, um, 
people think that the Tower of the Winds, and it wasn't exactly an observatory, but it contained um, an interesting water clock. Um, you didn't actually need um, a big tower for an observatory. All you needed was um, somewhere to house the instruments holding the telescopes. So in that um, case, what was this tower for? And, um, and the tower obviously is the architecturally most interesting part of the building. The tower um, was really, um, it's of three floors and it, um, each floor had a different purpose. Um, the ground floor was a ground entrance. Um, the first floor um, was basically a lecture room. Um, and later became a library. And the top floor um, um, did contain smaller telescopes and what happened there um, was that um, the Professor of Astronomy and the Radcliffe Observer could give lectures there on, um, on astronomy to not only students but also members of the public. It's worth bearing in mind that, that this is part of this big popular expansion of interest in science in the second part of the 18th century. You see it in things like the Birmingham Lunar Society and that kind of thing, which is the same kind of date as this. There would be lectures and demonstrations given on the top floor, um, and actually the windows on either side um, uh, it could be raised so that you could wheel small telescopes out onto the roof so that students could actually um, go and look um, at, at the stars from up there. So um, that's, that, that's broadly speaking um, the function of the building. Um, now the original designer um, was Henry Keane, who's not um, a household name among 18th century architects. He's actually best known, he was the surveyor of Westminster Abbey, and he's best known um, for um, various Gothic buildings he designed. But he was, um, like most architects, perfectly capable of designing an accomplished classical building, and you can see that if you just walk down the road from here to Worcester College, where he built the Provost Lodgings, which is a very nice building in the 1750s. Anyway, he was um, called upon um, in 1772 to provide a design for this building um, for the Radcliffe trustees, but was displaced um, a year later by a much more famous and fashionable architect, um, and that was James Wyatt. And the thing to remember about Wyatt was that this is right at the beginning of his very successful career. So he basically redesigns um, uh, Keane's building and um, it's, I think, reasonable to assume that he had the idea, which he no doubt um, mooted among the trustees, for making the top floor, the bit that has the, um, the, the, the movable telescopes in, um, a, a, a kind of copy, it's not an exact copy of course, um, of the Tower of the Winds in Athens, um, which is a Hellenistic building from the first century BC. Um, and you can see that like the Tower of the Winds, um, it's octagonal, it's not a perfect octagon, um, the sides are narrower than the, the main faces, um, but if you look up to the top, to the freeze level, you will see in more detail the carvings of the winds that I mentioned later, um, earlier, sorry. Um, they were carved by John Bacon, who was a very, very talented late 18th century sculptor. And so Bacon did these, and they are virtual copies of the carvings of the winds, um, and with their Greek names, as you can see underneath, um, carved on them. And then above that, um, the globe, that's based on the Farnese globe, um, which is now in the National Museum in Naples. Um, and you've got the globe supported by um, Hercules and I think Atlas and that's done in lead 
Um, again, a quick word about the stone and the materials. Um, originally built of um, Cotswold limestone, which um, has largely decayed um, and has been covered, I think, rather successfully by a shelter coat um, not that long ago, which has preserved what remains of the original stone which is mainly at the top. Um, the lower levels have been refaced and the two um, wings almost entirely refaced. So that's the stone, but also it's worth looking at the terracotta panels, um, which you'll see at first floor level um, above the windows. Um, and they're the signs of the, the zodiac. So if you look on the, um, on the left, um, you'll see um, Taurus the bull, the bull um, and um, so on and so forth, Cancer the crab above the um, entrance um, and so on. Um, and they were designed um, by a man called Rossi. So this again is a building which is proclaiming its purpose to some extent. Signs of the zodiac, the globe at the top, um, uh, as well as the um, functional but beautiful architecture which um, is intentionally um, reminding us um, of the origins of classical architecture um, in Greece and so that means that the building has a really important part to play um, in what I would call the first stage of the neoclassical um, movement in um, in British architecture in the second part of the 18th century. And um, it originally stood in a kind of parkland setting. I mean, I'm looking at a ghastly car park at the moment. Now this was all um, a lawn with trees and you approached it um, through winding paths. So it's almost like um, a very grand garden building. So we're now looking at the, um, the Oxford University Press Building, um, built in 1826 to the designs of an architect called Daniel Robertson, um, who um, later um, fell into debt and became bankrupt and moved away. Um, but um, this was um, uh, built in a period when the press have outgrown its original um, its original uh, home in the Clarendon building and the reason it outgrew its um, its original home was that there was such an enormous demand in the 19th century um, for Bibles um, and um, that of course was deeply related to the spread um, of um, British culture through the empire um, and through the um, growth of the population of this country, um, which um, especially the urban population, um, many of whom could by now um, read. Um, so that's why they needed a bigger um, factory essentially for um, production of the books and it is still the headquarters of the Oxford University Press which is a good thing. Um, now uh, the buildings are arranged around a courtyard um, and the show facade is the one you're looking at now to Walton Street which stretches up um, to um, from the centre of town and you go in through essentially a Roman triumphal arch if you look at the, um, the, the, the design of the Corinthian um, columns on either side of the archway with wings on either side um, and pavilions um, to the north and to the south. So in other words it's a very standard um, Roman inspired um, classical design again built of um, local ashlar again um, refaced um, and as I said still performing its original function. 
now in many ways a more um, a more spectacular more surprising building is the one that I'm standing underneath at the moment um, is the Blavatnik School of Government um, which was built um, to the designs of the firm of Herzog and de Meuron who of course are best known um, for Tate Modern um, and um, and many other buildings. They have an enormous portfolio. Um, and this was built um, between 2010 and 2015. So, first of all, what is it? And secondly, um, how, how is it designed? Well, what is it? It's a, basically a graduate school um, for um, people doing um, postgraduate degrees in things related to government. Blavatnik um, was a very wealthy donor um, and um, the building originally um, was housed in the former history faculty library in the centre of town but the idea was much more um, grandiose and so this open site um, was chosen for it and that it still fulfills that function. Um, as for how it's designed, central, um, circular, centrally planned building, top lit, um, an atrium um, with stairs mounting up it, um, and then seminar rooms um, on either side, and that's what we're looking at now. You're looking at the um, some of the rooms overlooking um, the street, and then at the top um, there's quite a nice um, terrace. Um, the, I mean, the basic materials you hardly need me to tell you because it's obvious from looking at it um, are concrete and glass. Um, you could say that this building um, was the first to really um, knock a hole in the idea of um, a coherent plan for the Radcliffe um, observatory site because it doesn't really relate um, to its surroundings except insofar as I suppose the glass mirrors the buildings along Walton Street um, and once that went up it really um, ensured that um, the, 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 this part of the site um, would be very architecturally varied let's say without rushing to judgment about the building itself which is very handsome in some ways. People have often said that um, contemporary architecture isn't very good at the monumental. Well I mean in a way this is um, trying to be monumental. What we're looking at here um, is a three-dimensional rendition of a Piranesi prince, actually, of a Roman building um, falling into de decrepitude. Um, but in fact, this building um, was built in the um, early 1830s as a new parish church for the suburb of um, Jericho which was just about to begin and the surrounding houses by an architect if I remember rightly called H.J. Underwood who did quite a lot of work in Oxford um, and um, from an architectural history point of view the um, interesting thing um, is that it's a Grecian building um, it's a very pure Greek revival building um, with a Grecian ionic portico um, the window um, frames are very correct. Um, you've got a cornice carried right round the building there. It was a simple preaching box like most Anglican churches were at that time. Um, a fascinating contrast actually between this and St Barnabas Church which was built after the Jericho suburb had been built. Um, this was clearly low um, and, the, uh, and St Barnabas was high. Um, and um, the other point to make about this is about conservation actually because when we see buildings of this period we nearly all see them, always see them nowadays um, with the original 
um, Headington stone or um, sometimes even Bath stone of this period um, refaced and cleaned and this is what buildings look like when they're not replaced and cleaned and the reason for that is this church became a cafe when it was decommissioned as it were the cafes never had any money to look after it the university isn't interested in it um, and so it's been allowed to gradually sink into this picturesque decay um, which in a way has a charm of its own so we've almost finished the um, circuit around the observatory site um, and like all these kind of things the buildings that frame the um, the, the, the enclosure are, are very important in establishing its character and in this case on the um, south side um, the frame is provided by um, two sets of student rooms um, for Somerville College um, which were designed by Neil McLaughlin um, and went up between 2009 and 2011. The housing at the time of the competition seems quite straightforward because in a way um, the piece of land that had been ceded to the college by the university was six meters wide by the length of the whole site and so all you could do was put in one corridor and one student room um, it was almost like a piece of thick wallpaper you put right down the side of the building. It was only later when we were developing the project post-competition that we saw the possibilities of designing one whole side of a street. And we realised that the project was perhaps less about the building itself and more about the possibility of making one side of a whole street. And that, that developed much more after we had won competition. And the one thing we were fairly certain of was that the side of the street to uh, the south, which was our side, was going to be all student accommodation and the side of the street to the north was going to be all academic uh, facilities of some kind and given the way that departmental buildings are designed, most likely academic offices fronting that street. So that was all we really knew about it. We started making a lot of very long models, I mean um, probably you know, this table here, probably twice the length of this table, of the whole street, just white card models of the whole street and trying to imagine how it could be composed. We started doing our street on the south side of the site. The thing that we picked up on was the way in which the boundary of Somerville College shifts just quite subtly as it goes along. And that if you looked at those subtle shifts and took them as a kind of inheritance, so to speak, and started playing other volumes against it, you would get a street that was almost the opposite to the character of those very strongly axial streets. And from that we flipped back to Pevsner's celebrated um, description of Queen's Lane coming from the high street through to um, the Central University area um, in front of the Bodleian. Um, and so we did a kind of photographic and drawn survey of Queen's Lane and brought it to the planning department and to Historic England and started to build an argument that the new street that we were making would have what we were describing as a kind of picturesque or episodic quality. So it was really thinking about a journey from Woodstock Road, just sort of ducking and diving around, always going towards smaller points of interest, so that you arrive out and suddenly you're given the Arch of Constantine as a big surprise. And then we ran the whole thing backwards as well, coming up from Walton Street. And you'll see little fragments of that as you go up. For example, on the outpatients building, now as you go up, walking towards Woodstock Road, you have mathematics on your left, which is great. And you have the outpatients building. We've built a little extension of it, which has got its windows centered on and looking straight down that street. But then just on the right-hand side, in the upper part of it, there's a fragment of an old sculpture from the old maternity hospital, which we've built into the wall there which is just leading you around the corner and taking you up to, up to Woodstock Road. So the intention was to try and allow the kind of natural development of the site to produce some of the picturesque episodic qualities that we treasured in other bits of Oxford. Our design for the Somerville buildings is, let's say, anticipatory of a street that will in the future run down there and we're like one hand clapping, we're designing one half of that street and hoping that others will come along after us and respond to that invitation. Um, but the other thing which is interesting is that 
Um, the buildings that we built for various reasons, which brought to technical reasons to do with taxation and so on, are all independent freestanding buildings. But we have built within the walls soft points where you can create doorways. Um, and when those doorways are created at any time in the future, the buildings will no longer be completely independent buildings, but will be capable of connecting through. So uh, all of the floor levels, and you'll see sometimes when you walk along beside those buildings, you'll see little funny anomalies in the floor levels and think, oh, why did they bring that window so low? Or why is that window so high? But actually it's because there's a completely invisible dialogue happening with the floor levels of the buildings which it's built back to back with. And so at some stage in the future, someone can take their sledgehammer out and just break through these holes in the wall and they'll find out that they'll break a hole in the wall at that soft point and they'll find that it's framed through an existing window to a view across a courtyard that no one knows about yet but sort of laid in store for somebody in the future. So it's kind of anticipatory of um, some point in the future when someone chooses to connect those buildings together and it'll make them much more integrated with the college. Um, and one of the things that we had was we had this range of buildings coming all the way down the side which had funny little courts and quads and um, windows that, that, that were dotted along it. And although you can't see it now, the new buildings that we've built uh, are anticipating opening up into those courtyards and creating new relationships. Particularly because with student accommodation we were forced into having quite long corridors there and they wouldn't be my choice of what you would have in student accommodation. There was no other solution to that, but we wanted in the future the possibility that those corridors would open off in different directions and connect right back into the existing buildings. So that was a strong part of the technical integration of the design at that time. Um, otherwise, I mean, I think that the, one of the key things about that building, this isn't so much historic, but one of the key things about that building is it's quite unusual to build a building that's got such a long north-facing facade. I mean, it's almost only north-facing. And um, we wanted to project the bays of the windows out um, so that um, you would get east and west light coming down the length of the street. So that, because a student room is unlike a room in an ordinary house, in that if you live in an ordinary house, there are lots of rooms and you can choose to move around at different times of the day. But for student rooms, you're always in that room and it's your room and it always looks that direction. So we felt that having a north-facing aspect on that wasn't ideal and that by getting these projecting bays in we created the opportunity to allow views along the street and to just bring a little bit of side light into them which explains why these boxes push out. A big interest of mine in architecture is the idea that buildings aren't finishable um, and um, the, the sort of present architects um, conception of the building being offered up for completion and the professional architectural photographer coming in and the building having its moment of perfection before anybody moves into it is the kind of antithesis of what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm much more interested in architecture as being a performance in time than I am about it being the creation of distinct artefacts with their own authorship and their own finite form. So the idea that the building is part of um, is part of a progression from the past into the future, which you uh, have a kind of um, which you have which you have a relationship with for a period of time, and then you pass on to other people. To me, is a much more enjoyable um, and interesting way of thinking about architecture. That it's something which is not so much an artifact as something which is performed over time, and that its changes over time are things that it's quite interesting. You make all you you you. you open up the possibility by being predictive of all these things that might happen in the future and then you watch with dismay as none of them happen. <laughs> but that's kind of, you know, you've got to, you, you've got to, you've got to accept that, that that's, that's the way that cities come about.